good morning. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, I am Ngozi Yokitaba. I am a associate professor of law and an assistant professor of computing and data sciences here at Boston University. I'm so excited to be moderating this incredibly important panel on partnerships within and between universities. This panel is incredibly timely. As you all know, public interest technology is an emerging field and it's interdisciplinary by nature and requires us to build partnerships between colleagues within our department, uh, outside of our departments, as well as to build partnerships with different institutional actors across campuses, uh, as well as external partners. And as this is an emerging field, public interest technology practitioners often have to be not only intentional, but creative. They must develop relationships with colleagues at different universities in order to build up their research and teaching practices and to thrive in the field they must share and gather resources and build vibrant communities of practice. And it's this inter uh, institutional partnerships that deepen the resources of Pitt and extend its reach. And I'm so excited to have uh, with us today um, some great speakers who can speak about uh, interdisciplinary um, partners inter um, partnerships. And so, um, I'm going to allow them each to uh, briefly introduce themselves. After that, uh, there'll be a moderated Q&A, and then I will open it up for audience questions. So if you wouldn't mind uh, starting us off, Elena. Hello. Hi. My name is Elena Eneva. Uh, I represent the University of the South, Suwani. I am the director of the Data Lab program there. And... I'll tell you briefly what Data Lab is. Um, it's a summer fellowship for undergraduate students. Um, the goal of that fellowship is to train aspiring data scientists to work on problems that really matter. So problems of social good. Uh, we work with nonprofits and government organizations to define projects. The students, led by industry experts and academia experts in the fields, uh, form groups, they work on them. At the end, we deliver it to our clients, whom we call partners, um, and then we do it again the next summer. Um, I'm also, um, many years ago, I helped start DSSG, Data Science for Social Good, at University of Chicago, now at Carnegie Mellon. So Data Lab is a sister program to that, except Data Lab focuses on undergrads, specifically um, in social good domains. Um, healthcare, education, transportation, public policy, um, and so on. So, very happy to be here. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> My name is Maya Turner, and I am a BU alumna. I was the former project manager for the Tech for Change Pitt Club Initiative at Boston University, and I helped lead the effort to run the first ever Civic Tech Hackathon that took place in this very room back in February. And I'm so, thank you. I'm so excited to talk about the partnerships I had in order to make this initiative come to life. We were working with Howard University very closely with their club, Pitt UN Club there. We also worked with the National Society of Black Engineers at Boston University, which I happen to be the president of as well. And then um, we also were working with BU Spark, which is a tech incubator on campus, which is very much was our sponsor for this whole initiative. So very happy to be here today and discuss um, my experience. I'm also currently a software engineer at Netflix. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. My name is Laura Bingham. I direct the Institute for Law, Innovation, and Technology at Temple University, based at the law school. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, Boston University, New America, for allowing us a chance to reflect on partnerships. Um, 
I'm relatively new. This, this is my first convening. I'm new to this community. Um, my background is as an anti-discrimination lawyer. So I spent the formative part of my career dealing with um, institutional, big structural uh, discrimination cases. I worked transnationally. Um, and so I, I have a deep familiarity with the power differentials, um, the, uh, when you're working with a big global organization, but you're trying to solve problems um, with clients and communities that are truly vulnerable, for instance, and, and sort of the, the, the skills and capacities that you need to develop to listen. Um, I think that's very much a part at the center of what we're trying to do with this community. It's also right at the center of the core values that we built into uh, ILIT, as we call it, the Institute at Temple. Um, so I, I felt like when I joined two years ago and discovered, one of the first things I did was to sign up for Pitt UN to apply to be a member, uh, because I felt like this framework was really going to help um, co-create something, uh, bring some of those same values into the, the academic sphere that I was entering, um, and also bring across some of the... Um, the challenges and the skills and the capacities that uh, you learn when you're trying to take on big structural issues uh, in community with a, a range of different partnerships. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? All right. Hi, I'm Brooke Williams. I am a professor here at BU and associate professor of the practice of computational journalism. Um, and uh, my colleague, uh, Zeebo over there, the executive director of Spark, um, and probably a lot of other amazing titles, <laughs> um, uh, we co-founded uh, a, a lab here. It's called the Justice Media Computational Journalism Co-Lab. And in that lab, uh, journalism students and students from the computing and data sciences partner on, um, they team up and work for a semester, um, sometimes longer, um, on data-driven investigations for news partners. Uh, we have local, hyper-local neighborhood news partners. We have uh, state, you know, uh, Boston, all the way into national and international. And uh, our students have published um, close to two dozen uh, pieces of work uh, that are holding powerful accountable and informing the public about, um, you know, what's going on in, in government and other areas of importance. Um, we focus on justice, uh, which I think is pretty much all investigative journalism, but we only take projects on that focus on justice. Um, that's it, thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Larry Suskind. I'm on the faculty at MIT. Um, I started and run the cybersecurity clinic at MIT. Uh, I'm also part of a Harvard MIT Tufts joint venture that's celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. But I remember so distinctly 40 years ago the parallel meetings at which, and we were just dealing with four or five universities wondering whether we could build a new field of negotiation and dispute resolution. And uh, 40 years later, there is a field, and it was constructed by faculty from 20 different disciplines, th th three primary universities, uh, quickly became self-financing by taking the teaching materials that we were all separately making and distributing those globally so that people could more rapidly build the field. And then we started offering executive training and the executive training and the teaching materials generated the revenue to fund the scholarship, the research, and the administrative work. So I've, I understand we're at a moment. Can all the schools and potential allies and partners represented here commit to build a field? People will do different things. They'll define the field different ways. We've never defined the field together in exactly the same way. It hasn't stopped it. But the issue is commitment. And it's my hope that as a result of today and tomorrow, we can firm up the commitment to help build together 
not just under one umbrella, a lot of separate things, but people working together to help build public interest technology as a field. Uh, thank you all so much um, for those important introductions and to showing the diversity of your experiences. I, look, I think we're going to have a really um, interesting conversation together. Uh, just to take us back a bit, back a bit I want to dig deeper into the concept of public interest technology and how it can operate as a framework for project creation, implementation, and success. And so on that front, um, Maya, if you wouldn't mind if we speak, start with you, can you speak to how the framework of public interest technology has helped you specifically identify a problem and how it's helped you uh, design an effective project? Of course. So for the first ever Civic Tech Hackathon, I don't know if you guys know what a hackathon is, but it's a usually a 24-hour event where we have students from across the country come together, ideate, create a project from scratch, a technology, a technology, a technical solution to a problem, and they present it at the end. And they usually stay up all night, they don't sleep, they have like coffee and they make a project. Mm -hmm. So for the Civic Tech Hackathon, we specifically want to focus on public interest technology and what problems that we can solve using technology that we usually don't try to solve using technology. So one of the tracks that we had, we had three tracks, but one of them was the develop a technical solution to help single parents. Now, we try to keep it broad. We also had some questions to help students like think of a solution to solve this issue. But to, the overall winner actually addressed this problem and they developed a, finan a financial literacy app to help parents teach their children how to save money and how to um, grow generational wealth. Because they saw that was a problem that if you are a single parent, usually you don't come from um, the most economic economically stable background. So it's important for children to know as they grow up how to use money in a correct way and how to save money and how to, not, to build economic stability for themselves. So that's how... That's an example of how I used, or the, the Tech for Change Pit Club initiative at Boston University, used the Pit framework to address a pressing problem. Thank you so much. Um, Laura, can we turn to you? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I think when I, when I joined Temple, um, I was, as I was saying, when I was doing my introduction, <laughs> I was much more familiar, just kind of going back to Andreen's comments that opened us up, you know, much more familiar with um, folks who were on the receiving end of innovation as sacrifice, <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, when I came into Temple, the first people that I connected with, actually, thank you, Maya, for explaining <laughs> what a hackathon is, was a group at, in Philadelphia called uh, Legal Hackers that were interested in hosting the first ever Philadelphia social, social justice hackathon. And, uh, you know, I approached it with some skepticism um, I, because I felt like it was coming from the same place of, you know, solutionism, right? Um, and, uh, but this, this was really a transformational experience for me. Uh, it, the, the public interest technology frame allowed us to connect across a few different universities in the Philadelphia area around the problem of real serious gaps in access to justice, access to legal representation. Um, and I discovered projects that were at Penn, at Drexel, at Villanova, that were really looking at this and looking at how um, technology, with the understanding that it was just one tool, um, could be translated, could be much made much more accessible in itself, could be much more approachable, and part of closing some of these gaps. Um, so we organized last fall around this time a social justice hackathon. We did it very um, uh, thoughtfully and conscientiously in the communities. So we actually opened it up to members of the community who would walk off the street and kind of come in, be in a project. 
Um, and uh, that, that was the foundation of some of the most important partnerships that I have now in Philadelphia across different um, academic institutions. And I think we'll go into it later, but this, this was the basis for how we organized our career fair, which is coming up uh, on Saturday. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, Larry. There's, um, there's there are people who've been teaching cybersecurity in universities for some time. Um, but about four or five years ago, um, I looked around at MIT. There were people teaching cybersecurity in computer science and in the management school. And all of the people who were graduating were going to work in the private sector where you could get paid a good salary to be a chief information security officer. And my teaching in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning led me to be concerned that nobody was teaching cybersecurity for folks who would go work in cities. And the task is different, very different. You really need to teach a different course in a different way. And uh, w because MIT had recently joined uh, uh, Pitt UN, there were some seed funds available and we use those funds to create a cybersecurity clinic for public interest technology. In our case, cybersecurity clinic uh, to protect uh, infrastructure, critical urban infrastructure. We designed the course and we began to hear from people in other places, oh, could you share some of those materials? We, we would like to teach cybersecurity, we're not a computer science department. I said, well, go find some buddies in computer science on your campus. I mean, my, my, op my advantage at MIT is MIT undergraduates, about 40% of them are majoring in computer science. 40% of 4,500 undergraduates are majoring in one of 35 fields. And if I could get some of those undergraduates mixed with graduate students who are working in urban management and public policy, they would be great teams. And so we built the cybersecurity clinic around that idea. And immediately the connections with other schools started. And because my uh, Berkeley colleague, who you'll hear in the program tomorrow, uh, said, MIT and Berkeley should see if we couldn't organize the schools that are trying to do cybersecurity in the public interest, which is not every place teaching cybersecurity. And we slowly and then suddenly built a consortium, the consortium of university-based cybersecurity clinics, cybersecurityclinics.org, describes the 17 schools roughly now that are members. And we have a monthly phone call, which our Berkeley colleagues organize. And people talk about the issues they're facing in building out their clinic. Or new schools come on saying, what's the first thing I have to do? How do I convince the university to let me do it? Does it have to be in a computer science department? Every issue about public interest technology is embodied in the cybersecurity institution building task. And we have in just four years to build a consortium of schools to share all their teaching materials. They're all online. To help each other, to find a way to help build the field together and it's a wide open system. It's not close to anybody in any way. So my sense is that the collaboration between people with a shared interest in different universities can lead to institution building to advanced public interest technology. Thank you. Uh, Brooke? Hi. So um, I work across the street mostly um, in the College of Communication. And I spent a lot of time <laughs> looking, uh, calling Ziba and other people over um, in the Computing and Data Sciences to say, I don't know, we get 
a thousand PDFs from a government agency and we want to convert them into structured data. We know it's possible, but we don't know how to do it. <laughs> we teach data journalism, but does it get into AI and these very complex computational methods that are taught here and that students study for four years? No, it does not. So um, after uh, several years of uh, little projects, um, like me calling and saying, hey, do you think you could help me get a machine to read all of these court decisions? <laughs> Um, we decided, why not make it a formal lab, a, a co-disciplinary lab, right? Um, where students work together on teams to do this type of work that's very important to the public interest. Um, the investigative journalism is absolutely crucial to public interest. Uh, and so, and so that's, that's what we did, um, and that's how we thought about um, you know, public interest technology um, as, as we did it. Um, I would, <clears throat> it's been a, a, a real success. The students have um, not built silos. We encourage them to not build silos to really actually work together. So we have, you know, data science students going out and not conducting interviews, but being there, right? And then we have the journalism students sitting down at the computer and sort of asking questions, like what could we ask this data to further our project? And working with that computer science student to write those queries or to, to write those algorithms to scrape documents um, or other things. Um, there's a lot of information out there that journalists need and we need public interest technology framework in order to make that information usable in a way that we can analyze it and determine what is going on and inform the public. And um, it's been amazing to see all of the things. I, I, we've done things that I never imagined we would. Um, and one in, example is um, a, a story um, that was on NBC um, showed a pay gap at um, a university. And we had, we'd, we'd used an algorithm to assign gender. And my mind just was kind of blown thinking, as a journalist, all the things we could do if we can accurately assign gender to names with all this data out there, um, looking at gender disparities and inequities. Um, so anyway, that, that's it. Thanks. Thanks. Elena? Yeah, so hearing all these uh, interesting and very different stories, um, it makes me think how mine fits inside. So um, my background is uh, machine learning and AI. I've spent um, about 20 years working uh, on delivering AI for clients, uh, then uh, doing AI research in um, um, industry labs. Um, and AI is a tool, right? And on its own, it doesn't matter. It matters what you apply it to. So there was a time, not, uh, still happens now, but, but mostly, you know, if you think 10 years back maybe, the greatest minds in AI were working on what? On ads, on sponsored search, right? Um, and I think everybody has seen, going back to what, um, Larry was saying this boom in interest in computer science, right? How many people are majoring? How many people are, if you look at resumes, and I spent a lot of time looking at um, grads' resumes, um, almost everybody who's done any computer science, right, is saying, I'm a computer scientist. And almost all of those are saying, I do AI, right? I do machine learning. Um, I've also spent a lot of time recruiting for industry. And uh, when I talk to people, what uh, what is it that we work on, you know, how would you spend your time here? Well, we work on these projects and these projects. And you know when their eyes light up is when you mention anything about social good, right? Um, I think it's a little difficult to engage people in social good or public interest. Um, if you say, why don't you come work for us? You make a lot less money. How does that sound? <laughs> um, but we're we're lucky because uh, technology and, you know, in my case, AI and machine learning, um, you don't have to make a, a big sacrifice and say, okay, I'll just live on the street, but I'll work for public good. You, you really don't have to. There's 
many amazing opportunities to make a difference in, in healthcare and education, as I was saying uh, before. So uh, we started um, about 10 years ago, Data Science for Social Good, with this thought of, we want to train more computer scientists to work, and not, not actually computer scientists, I take that back, we want to train more data scientists from various backgrounds, computer science, statistics, economics, um, social sciences, uh, to work on problems that matter. And how do we do that? How do we create a community? How do we show the possibilities? How do we find real projects so it isn't another class, you know, and another kind of boot camp where come and code with us and then you'll be qualified to work on this later. So um, this is how the, the DSSG, Data Science for Social Good, was born and many programs that have um, kind of blossomed out of that since. And it has now spread across many universities on different continents. Um, and the... Um, the idea is that there's a lot of pent up um, interest in working on these things, on making the world better. Um, it doesn't have to happen when you've made your millions and then you're thinking, okay, how about now I work on social good? We have to capture the interest while um, people are getting trained, while they're uh, passionate and choosing what to work on. We have to give them kind of a viable options, right? And uh, we have to do it across across interests, so hence the multidisciplinary um, emphasis of, of this panel, which makes me very happy. So we work with, um, so students from all over the U.S. apply. Uh, we work with um, experts from uh, various domains, because as I was saying before, um, AI, machine learning, is not a domain, right? It's a tool. So we need to have people who understand healthcare. We need to have people who understand homelessness. We need to have people who understand um, predatory lending, all these problems that we're trying to fight. Um, and so we collaborate with people from both academia. Um, it's a little bit, well, I'll get into the challenges later. From academia and from industry and um, what our program is made of is it's made of people uh, with very, very diverse backgrounds who are passionate about working in technology and making a dent in a social good, public interest um, kind of um, endeavor. Uh, thank you all. What we've heard from all the panelists is how not only is public interest technology as a framework important to how they approach their research, what work they've done, um, and their experiences, but that it really requires collaboration. And so at this point, let's turn to that question of partnership and some of its difficulties and how do you do it? How do you uh, develop partnerships within and between universities? And Laura, I'd love uh, to start with you. Um, could you let us know what kinds of partnerships did you need to develop in order uh, to make your work possible? And how did you incentivize uh, people to join you? How did you collaborate with uh, faculty and students? Sure, and um, thank you. Yeah, I, so I think there's so many different ways to answer this question. Um, and uh, you know, I feel like our institute and, and you know, kind of the culture around is very much an informative sort of base building stage so you know the the first the earliest partnerships and and you know, this is just going to be a sustained effort are with students and with community organizations our mission is built around inequity um in terms of representation and and like taking that message to our students making sure that they understand that uh, you know public interest law let alone public interest technology <laughs> is some is a place that is welcoming where people belong um, so that that whole set of work um, you, you know involves these critical partnerships right but I, I wanted to talk maybe a little bit about the career fair just to be more specific um, and and because it's something that we're just deeply involved in our career fair is focusing on, on specifically law and public interest technology because we're based at the law school. We're sort of starting where we are within the community where we're most closely based. And this is a multi-institutional thing, so we're, we're doing it in partnership with that same set of universities that I spoke about before. Um, 
but one of the one of the challenges that we have with getting our students to really feel empowered to come into this space and learn about it is is this financial the, exactly what Elena was talking about right these are students who are in a professional program there's a long tradition of um, you know two tracks <laughs> public interest law uh, where your salary is going to be very low and you need other kinds of resources to come in and do it so there are huge diversity and equity issues there already um, that the students are engaging with deeply um, and and then the private sector where there's a lot more emphasis on career pathways it's just much clearer um, and there's a lot of channeling in that direction um, and so with the messaging and the organizing uh, around this career fair, one of the partnerships we really need to forge is with, with employers. Because we can make the case and we can talk, we ha people, there is that social justice commitment, very much so. Um, but it does need to translate into a career pathway. And so the, the career fair work, um, we've, I think that's going back to the public interest technology framing being kind of adaptable and flexible it's allowed us to cast a broader net in terms of the employers that we're bringing to campus now at this, in this first conversation with our students about what this is and what opportunities it could bring for them in the future. So uh, I think we've, that's why the framework has been so helpful and um, being able to define it in relation to public interest law, but also saying how this expands, how, how it's different and how this can be a field um, where, where everyone actually is welcome. The first question that you always get is, but I don't have a computer, I don't have a, this background, I don't have a science background, I'm not a patent agent coming into law school. Um, so I think that finding employers that will help us <laughs> uh, deliver that message that actually they, they are looking for a broader set of skills and they do have this commitment. That, that's been a, a sort of critical partnership, it's a work in progress for sure, to, to build those connections. Uh, and Larry, you kind of talked about this a bit before, but could you speak a little bit more about the kinds of partnerships you needed and talk to us a little bit about um, not only faculty and students and institutionally, but also external funders? So uh, my experience after many decades of trying to get schools and departments to work together is to zoom in and find an individual in each of those schools and departments and find people who have their own incentive, their own reasons for wanting to work together. You can get heads of universities to sign agreements that they'll cooperate. It doesn't mean anything until you make the connections between the individuals. So uh, we're using our time at MIT to see if we can learn more about how to help individuals with a shared interest in public interest technology learn from each other, talk with each other, and then I hope we can scale that up within Pitt UN. If you have a chance, you look at technologist.mit.edu. Publication that we made, to it, it's free, uh, to try to get people at MIT who would not ever run into each other, talk to each other, teach together, share students, advise theses together, and yet once they discover they have a shared interest in public interest technology, all the boundaries melt away. For those individuals, uh, the editor of The Technologist is here, one of our students, Emily Flamme, and what we're looking for is to use this year to, to model how to make this partnership between different departments and fields work within one university and then hope with Pitt UN to scale this up. And we interview two faculty, two students every month and we say, we go to them on purpose, you're working on an interesting technology, either new or, or redoing old or studying technology, could be anything. And we say, tell us about your technology in, you know, 700 words. Then, is your technology doing anything in the public interest? Innocent, ask them the second question. And we write out their answer. And then we ask them a third question. 
What more do you think you could be doing in the project that you have, in the work you're doing, to better serve public interest? And they struggle to answer that. And we condense, Emily condenses that interview, faculty, student, two every month. We'll, we're gonna get around to 24 faculty in all different parts of the campus, and we're looking at cross-cutting themes. What do they have in common? How can they talk to each other? And I'm convinced that when we can help individuals with a shared interest in public interest technology, regardless of their fields, understand that they have common interests in public interest, we can scale up that conversation. But I think it's about getting individuals to talk to each other and see what the reason is that it's beneficial to work together, not because we're trying to build institutional arrangements in some uh, uh, way that says the field is growing, because it won't be unless there's individuals collaborating. Thank you for that, and particularly raising the importance of individuals speaking to each other, because that is critical to building up partnerships. Uh, Brooke, I'd love to hear your views. Um, so it was important for us to build trust with news organizations um, in order for them to work with us, um, especially journalism students and um, competing in data science students um, who haven't graduated yet. Uh, so there's structure that we put in place that helped to build that trust. Um, we have um, Spark um, at CDS uh, as a part of our, the Justice Media Collab and provides uh, project management, um, uh, troubleshooting, um, you know, technical um, uh, assistance, um, a lot of experts in residence. So there's a, a lot of structure already, a lot of support for the students um, in addition to um, me and my co-professors, so we co-teach the class. Um, and then, you know, uh, it takes time to build trust with external partners, um, uh, and it takes publishing. So once we published a several articles, um, you know, some big ones, um, like on the front page, uh, people started to notice, um, and that was one, one, one path. The other path is that you've heard of news deserts. You've heard about what's going on. I, I don't think journalism students who are looking in, to get into investigative journalism have like a, a, a path that's toward money. <laughs> yeah, there, there's really one path, um, and it doesn't lead there. Um, so <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, uh, the. So with this framework, um, we, we've, we've shown the, the partners that, that the students are passionate. Um, we've made the, the course like application only, like the, the, the lab itself. Um, and so we get the, the brightest and the most eager students that really want to pursue this. Um, and um, in terms of incentivizing, um, as I was mentioning, there's these news deserts, there's areas um, in Boston, um, all over there's newspapers. I mean, the, the Boston region. I can think of dozens and dozens of newspapers that desperately need help covering local government, covering uh, the state legislature, covering things that matter to people that live um, in those areas that are really important. And it can be done um, much more precisely um, and have more impact if it's done with computational methods. Um, and so uh, really just explaining that to editors, explaining the, the how important this public interest technology, this computational aspect is to journalism, which is also in the public interest, um, and showing the proof of it, right? Showing the impact that it's had um, has been really important. Um, uh, Maya? Okay. Um, I want to talk about how Laura and Larry, you guys were talking about how financial was a component that is often deters students into getting into pit initiatives. Well, at least on campus, 
I became an employer with a the project with my project manager job, and that was very liberating and empowering that I was able to provide jobs to students. When I first joined the PU initiative at Boston University, there was a lack of passion. I can't speak about what I wasn't there for, but there was a lack of passion. And the team, I joined in October, and we had the team slowly dwindled to about three people who were willing to stick it out. But we had a major event to plan by February and to execute. So Ziva, VU Spark, I would say is the main, they were the best partnership I had. They were my sponsor, they were my champion. So shout out to BU Spark for everything. But mm -hmm. I had to look elsewhere on campus to find dedicated students who are willing to put in the work to make this event happen. And I was also, by the way, the president of the National Society of Black Engineers on campus. And I was leading these two initiatives concurrently. And when I was up, when it was time for me to find new people, I had to find, I had to employ like nine people in like a few weeks, in a few weeks before winter break started. I turned to my club because that club was my home for three years, for four years, and then I became the president and I knew all those students in the club very intimately. We were peers, we were colleagues, they were hard workers. So when I said I needed individuals to work over break, winter break, um, to be willing to put in hours for an event that is going to be happening in two months, a major event, 24 hour event, that's going to happen very soon. Um, and they're gonna have to like put in a lot of work. They were hungry, they were willing, and they were excited that it was a public interest technology initiative and that they were getting paid. So that I was able to, and Spark is one of the major, it's a, usually is the highest like salary that you can get on campus. And everybody wants to work at Spark. So the, <laughs> so the fact that I could come to, as a leader of my club, could come to my peers and say, hey, I need to employ, I need to make this event happen. If you're hungry, if you're willing to pull in a work, let's do it. So much interest, so much people who are passionate, so much people who are willing to get involved that it was like kind of overwhelming, but it was good because I got to pick up the litter. Like, you know, I got to make my choices. And I turned like a three person team into like a 12 person like force. And we put this event together. There's times where we're like, oh, I don't know if we can do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um, it was like such success. You had over like 100 students to attend. Um, they all said, wow, it's so organized. We're like, wow, thank you. <laughs> um, but I would say that make, being an employer and being able to give like high salary jobs on campus was a major part of the incentivizing, but also having people who trusted me and having people who, having those connections also allowed individuals to join in the this pit Tech for Change effort to put on the first Civic Tech Hackathon. And from there, I passed the torch on to a mentee of mine who's now the project manager, shout out to Rania. And she is now leading the team and she also um, some people joined, but she also hired students from Nesby. So now it's it's great to see how this is like a path of employment opportunities from very talented, motivated students on campus. And Elena. Uh, Elena? Um, well, Sewanee is a small liberal liberal arts university and uh, partnership between and within the university um, is kind of baked into the ethos, right? Baked into everything we do and how we do things. Um, so for Data Lab, uh, it's very similar. We, rather than starting something and then saying, now how do we, how do we collaborate? 
it's the other way around, right? We set it up that it has to be collaborative. There's just no way it will work unless it's collaborative. And then you grow the collaborations afterwards. Um, we have different types of collaborations. Um, I'm gonna set aside the collaborations with governments, with nonprofits for now, since we're talking about universities. Um, the, we need to create teams of fellows, and the teams have to be interdisciplinary. So you can't have a team of just computer scientists or just statisticians or you know half economists and half computer scientists. You have to have a mix, not because diversity is good and you know we have to promote this, uh, but mainly because otherwise the projects don't work. You don't find the solutions, you don't have the right answers, you miss things, you don't have fair and equitable um, approaches, the, uh, the the data may be biased and you may not notice that, and the solutions, you know, you're, you've heard one of my favorite expressions, garbage in, garbage out, right? So <laughs> that's what ends up happening. So it has to be this way. Um, the people who direct, um, who help set up the programs, who set up the partnerships, run the projects, mentor the students, they also have to come from different places. Imagine if they all came from the same university, right? Right. Not to mention even the same department. It just would not work, right? Um, we have to um, combine and get um, different areas, different domains, expertise, and experience. For example, if you work on a public health project, um, Coming, coming from industry, I've seen many times that uh, somebody says, we have this data, we're trying to figure out this pattern, can you do it? Like, yeah, we have the data, we can do it, right? <laughs> and you can't unless you talk to somebody who has worked with the data, who has worked in this domain, who has faced challenges, then you understand that you don't really know what the fields mean or how the data is collected and why there might be bias here and not bias there, and what you... Um, what a successful solution means. Uh, a very tiny anecdote as an aside. Um, in Data Science for Social Good, we had a project to um, do early um, diabetes detection in uh, underserved uh, populations, including uh, homeless populations. And uh, one of the patterns we found, not surprisingly, in the data is that uh, if you smoke, then your odds of um, getting diabetes are very high, right? So what can we say as data scientists about it? Well, um, put, a, um, put a note for the doctor, automatically pop up something saying, please counsel your patient to stop smoking. But when we worked with the um, doctors who were going to use the system, one of the first things she said is, I would never tell an unhoused person to stop smoking. Can you imagine how cruel that is? And everybody's mind, everybody's mind in the room were blown, right? Really? You wouldn't? know. I wouldn't. That's not how we would address it. You know, this is one of their few coping mechanisms, and you know, you can't take it away if you say it. Even if you say it, they won't do it, right? And it just completely shifted everybody's perspective. So collaboration is like air, right? It has to be between and within universities and other groups. And uh, otherwise, it just does not work. It's, a, it's not a nice to have. It's a must have. Yeah, so we've heard some really great stuff. I mean, in terms of how to develop partnerships, we've heard about the importance of trust, identifying uh, the right partners, a diverse set of partners, and just the importance of personal connection. But what also came out is a bit that this is challenging. And so I want to turn to that before we get to audience questions. Um, what are some of the institutional challenges and barriers when you're trying to build and sustain partnerships within and between universities? And Larry, we'll start with you. So uh, many of you could imagine the following scenario. You find partners, five universities. You realize you want to work together because you're all approaching an issue from a different perspective, but you all share an interest in the subject. So you say, you know, it would be great if my students could take your courses, <laughs> not just mine, we could have a specialization that crosses five universities. And one or two courses in the same field from each of those places would be on a list. And students who can't get that 
extra dimension or that complementary uh, set of methods could take those courses. And it's easy for the people that want to collaborate to imagine actually retuning their courses so that they all fit together in, an, in a neat way, take out overlap, and, and really imagine a stream of students who would be able to take the set of courses. And then reality hits. You try to present, take your choice of the level of administrator above you, department, school, institutions, professional association, you, you name it. You can't give credit at one school for a course taken at another school. And those of us in the academy who've lived for decades with that immediate response usually say, okay, well, we guess we can't do this because there must, there's these hidden rules that have to do with how universities are financed and how professional associations award different schools status and standing for different degrees. And if suddenly they're including courses that are from outside that school, then there's a question of their accreditation. You could, there's 10 different directions from which you will get bombarded with a Simple idea, we were trying to build a field. We're working together. We're gonna to make an efficient, cooperative arrangement. We can't do this in our place. That's the whole point of the partnership that we're making. And then the question is, okay, what do we know about how to work around these problems? Because there are such things. They're not known to the people you're now raising it with for the first time in your place, and you don't know about a lot of them, but you might know about one of them. And then the response will be, we can't do that here. And what we need is the scale of collaboration that Pitt UN represents so that we could take streams, five, six, seven streams of courses, different members within Pitt UN, different fields, lay out those specializations that no school could do on their own, generate the financial support from the regional industrial partners. I mean, when I work on cybersecurity, I point out there are over 700,000 unfilled good cybersecurity jobs right now, and no, no flow of people to take them. And so anything from a national human resources standpoint that could be done ought to be done and universities ought to be making this possible, not impossible. And so we need to figure out, can we share stuff online? Can we share stuff through summer study? There's a whole series of workarounds where you're not really getting support for the idea, but you're finding a way to avoid opposition to the idea. And so th this one theory of how to cope with challenges. Great, uh, Maya, and then we'll turn to uh, audience questions. Yeah, so I was just like thinking about some challenges that we face or policy can face as Tech for Change and the Pit Club initiative grows, which is how to like scale. Right now at Boston University, we do have an affiliate model where we are partnering with the National Society of Black Engineers to kind of do the Tech for Change Pit Club initiatives, but you can also have um, a, a club, a, a, a Tech for Change club, and which Howard has. And we wanna continue to scale this up, and how can we make sure that as we scale this national, in this national club network to make sure we, continue, we can collaborate well with schools that are not present right here, or have a different model as we do. Uh, one challenge that we faced was just communication with Howard at times because we were operating, very, um, we were doing a lot of groundwork um, as as project as the project manager and making sure that like us our two schools were on the same page. Of course, like we were, but making sure that we had like Zoom calls like weekly to make sure that we were caught up on work and like making sure that tasks were even just marked off as done so people knew the state of the work we have done was a challenge that we had working on this Civic Tech Hackathon. 
Thank you all so much. I want to take our remaining 10 minutes and um, have some audience questions. Um, we have some folks uh, walking around with microphones. We'd love to hear from you all. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to know how do you find your projects? Uh, Laura, would you like to take that one? Not working. Okay, find them like um, <laughs> in what sense? Like, how do we identify what we'll work on? Yep. Ah, okay. Um, well, I think for for maybe this is true for all of us, but certainly for me, um, I brought a set a set of partnerships with me when I came into the role. Um, so I think some of this is really just kind of building uh, where there are open doors, <laughs> you know, um, and uh, thinking about what's going to align with the values that uh, I've talked about, that we defined for the Institute in the first place. Um, are these going to be projects that are sustained, sort of sustained over time? So for instance, um, one of the pro, and I, do, I, I didn't mention this, but we do a lot of um, clinical work. Uh, and that I think speaks to some of the same challenges, you know, there aren't really the same kind of institutional structures necessarily to support and grow that kind of work and channel it, channel students to it. Um, and one of the projects that we took on early on is a research project on uh, border surveillance technology with a, a civil society, par a couple of civil society partners. Um, and it, you know, it was it was sponsored uh, by my previous <laughs> employer, which was at Open Society Foundation. So it was a continuation of work that I had before, um, and uh, that project uh, was already designed around sort of a similar solidarity building framework. We wanted to partner with other organizations across this region in the Western Hemisphere that are also looking at the problem sort of from a transnational perspective, and it was something where a lot of different research and um, interdisciplinary uh, outputs uh, were envisioned. So it was like a pilot phase, it was something we could involve our students in, it reflected our values, and it was something that we could continue to fundraise for through uh, sponsored research sort of year on year. Um, so I mean, that's, I think, one example of just stitching a, a number of pre-existing kind of platform partnerships together, but also thinking about, well, how can this be sustained? How can it bring in more work and kind of branch off into other projects? Uh, Larry, and then I will take another question. So, so we run a cybersecurity clinic every semester. We want to help five to seven communities. The first year, we called around to different cities and towns, and they said, who the hell are you? And are you talking cybersecurity, sensitive stuff? You can't, uh, students are gonna come and work in the city on this? I mean, clinical course. Um, so I said, well, okay, I need a sponsor. So I went to the Mass Cyber Council, which is a state-created entity that helps all 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts uh, on cyber. And I said, could you tell your members that for free, they could get teams of trained MIT students to come and help them. I didn't send out anything. They sent out that announcement, and I got three that year. And then the next semester, I went back to them and said, would you do the same thing again? They said, yeah, and the three that you work with, I'll write them into the thing we send out. Then we got too many. We had 10, and we could only do five. Then I said, oh, it's the sponsorship thing. So I went to the state agency responsible for cybersecurity and I said, uh, you don't have staff providing assistance to cities and towns, you just have staff to tell them that they need it. Uh, would you please send out to all the cities and towns a recommendation that we can do this? Now we have a queue. Um, you know, I can stop teaching and the next generation of faculty that teach cybersecurity will have clients uh, ready. Sp sponsorship from within the entity. If it's a not-for-profit entity, find a network, an organization, let them find you the projects. Now, in our case, we're not asking anyone to pay anything. So that makes it easier. If you were asking someone to pay, 
it, w it would be that much harder. But you have to be really clear about what you're going to deliver, and you have to be really clear that the students you're going to let loose on this have been trained. And that's why we have a four-week online training program and an exam at the end of it. And if you don't pass the exam, you have to drop the course. Now, I've never, not, I've never had an MIT student not pass that exam. But the same course is a MOOC for the world at large for free. And the exam, if you want to take it, is $129. And the pass rate is 50%. But if I can say, we have people ready to help you. Then we need MIT general counsel to help us write the letter of agreement. I'm not allowed to ask students to sign NDAs. MIT won't permit that. But I can sign a letter of agreement saying, I will make sure the students do and don't do this, and everything is going to remain confidential. And even the final product that we produce goes to the, whoever signed the document in the city, and we can't use it. I am allowed to strip some data from it that's unidentifiable by place to give to the research team that's working on the problem more theoretically, but we can't show off the product anywhere. And what the city does with it, it's completely up to them. We don't talk to the press, and students have to, have to understand that this is supposed to be quiet because we will be producing an assessment of that city's weaknesses. That could make them subject to cyber attack if somebody got their hands on that. So it's sponsorship and time, good performance, and the sponsor then takes more responsibility. I know we're at time. I want to add one tiny thing. Um, Agree with everything, and one more thing that we do is everything we produce is open source, and that has a way of spreading the word, right? And people find you, and they come, they want to talk to you. Also, social media, I think we all know the power. But open source really helps, because um, not, only, not only does it spread the word, but actually you, you, you start things in other locations, right? That uh, just amplifies the impact. All right. Sorry, that's it. Uh, great, this was a wonderful um, panel. I just want to uh, thank our panelists. Thank you so much.